How you start your novel is one of the most important decisions that you will ever make as a writer, be it the proverbial hook that you use, the opening line, or the point of view you write from. But let's consider whether you should use a prologue. You know, one of those things that us literary nerds forget into five fights over on Poetry Night. But first, a big thank you to Squarespace who are sponsoring this video, with whom I've built my own website linked down below, where you can actually find the script, the notes for this video, plus the notes for a few other videos. Think of them like your own research notes to take away. And if you want to build your own website, then please go to squarespace.com slash hellofutureme and use the code hellofutureme to get 10% off your first purchase. More on them later. As always, the best way to begin your novel will vary depending on your style, your genre, and your personal creative choices. I'm not here to tell you how you should write your novel, but there are some ways of doing prologues that work better than others in terms of engaging the reader. A prologue is a segment of the story that takes place before the first chapter, and the defining feature of a prologue is usually its distance from the main narrative. This might be because of a point of view, it's told from the perspective of a different character to the main story, like in The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson, b time, it takes place significantly after or before the main narrative, like in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, which takes place 10 years prior, or c geography it takes place in a vastly different setting to the majority of the narrative, like an altered carbon. Today we'll be discussing hooks, necessity, backstory, exposition, unique tone mood or theme, and length. Firstly, hooks. Having both a prologue and a first chapter usually means that you have two hooks at the beginning of your book, two big questions that you introduce to your reader. The challenge with this double hook structure is the prologue hook can undermine the tension arising from the hook in the first chapter. This is because some authors use the prologue to explain a mysterious element of the story. Imagine for example if Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince used a prologue hook that explicitly depicted Snape making the unbreakable vow to kill Dumbledore if Draco could not do it. Then, in the first chapter, the hook was Harry suspecting that Draco and Snape were up to something. There are two problems here. Firstly, the reader would already know what Draco and Snape were up to, meaning that the hook in the first chapter carries no weight. Secondly, it makes the prologue pointless. If the reader was going to wonder what Draco and Snape were up to by the first chapter, then the prologue is just slowing down the reader getting to that point. So instead, when using this double hook structure, it's important to have each hook target a different question in the narrative. Rowling understood this, and in The Half-Blood Prince, Snape's prologue leaves the reader wondering what has Snape promised to do if Draco can't, while the first chapter has nothing to do with that. Instead, it starts off with Dumbledore offering to take Harry on a secret mission, leaving the reader wondering what is Dumbledore planning? Now these two hooks eventually become somewhat connected, but that's not till way later in the book. As a side note, I really encourage you to watch my video on writing the first chapter where we discuss the three act structure, opening lines, and the hook in far more detail. So your prologue hook might be distinct from the first chapters, but it's important to consider the type of hook as well. The advantage of a prologue is it lets you write from a different character's point of view, or at a different time, or in a different place. This means that they are often used to depict pivotal scenes crucial to the development of the tension of the story that the characters in the main narrative couldn't possibly be aware of. For example, in A Game of Thrones, the prologue is written from the perspective of a Night's Watchman, and it depicts the mysterious others far north of the Wall murdering a number of the Night's Watch, raising wildlings from the dead, and playing Tetris with their bodies. This A tells the reader that there are fantastical elements coming, and B it introduces the threat that one of the main characters, John, will face but cannot be aware of yet. As the the supernatural threat doesn't even appear until chapter 52, 500 pages into the story. Instead, at the beginning, it's this medieval realism, and John is neither at the wall nor does he know what's going on there, so it'd be incredibly difficult to introduce this supernatural threat in the main narrative without dropping awkward exposition of, so, <laughs> did you hear about how there's like, ice zombies? Lol. <laughs> So, so undead. The prologue hook should be something that cannot be effectively communicated early in the main narrative, because either the main characters cannot know about it or suspect it, but is still crucial to the development of the tension later in the story. Secondly, necessity. The prologue is the first experience that the reader has of your story, meaning it's even more critical for you to consider why is this segment necessary to read? 
something you should actually ask about every part of your story, by the way. One great example of a necessary prologue is in John Green's Paper Towns, where we get a scene in the past of Quentin and Margot finding a dead body in the park. Now, this scene is crucial because of one particular line. Lots of people get divorces and don't kill themselves, I said. I think I maybe know why, she finally said. Why? Maybe all the strings inside him broke, she said. This line introduces the metaphor of the strings that Green repeatedly references throughout the book. It's even the title of one third of the book. Without showing the reader where this metaphor comes from and Margot's way of thinking, we wouldn't be able to as accurately grasp the themes and how Quentin thinks about Margot, which is a massive part of the story. The information given in this prologue is immediately relevant to the reader's understanding of the story, its themes, and the way that it is presented is far more visceral than if we were just told about this experience from when they were kids. But let's talk about something that I know a lot of people are concerned with when writing a prologue character, backstory, and specifically when and whether it's necessary in a prologue. So it can be tempting to go, hey, my character has this uh, traumatic past and that, that matters and it'll make them care about it, so uh, here you go, reader. But yeah, no. Most of the time, backstory is better given as a flashback later in the story or woven in through creative exposition, meaning you should go straight to chapter one and just jump in. This is because a lot of the time that event in their past doesn't help the reader understand the beginning of your novel. It's relatively disconnected. For example, let's consider which elements of character backstory Neil Gaiman gives us in his prologue to the fantastic book Stardust, one of my favorites. The prologue doesn't tell us that Tristran is the son of the long lost princess of Stormhold. Instead, it focuses on Tristran's father going to the magical land of fairy. The use of character backstory here is effective because it only shows us the things that help us better understand Tristran's motivations and mindset as a character. We see where he got his curiosity for the land of fairy from, his father. Explaining that he's the long lost heir to the throne has a place in the overall story, but it's entirely irrelevant to understanding the first chapter because Tristran doesn't even know it. Gaiman didn't include this because it's disconnected from the beginning of his story. Another example to think about is Altered Carbon, which shows Takeshi Kovacs in his old body and depicts how he was captured. The use of this piece of character backstory works because the first episode shows Takeshi waking up in a new body. This creates a juxtaposition between the prologue and first chapter. Seeing the same character in two bodies is jarring for both the viewer and the character, and it really helps us understand the fundamental premise of the story, that people can shift their consciousness into a new body. In both of these examples, a backstory prologue is only used in so far as it helps us understand the first chapter or the beginning of the story. What makes a prologue necessary is that it introduces an element fundamental to understanding the novel from that point forward in a far more impactful way. When it comes to a backstory prologue, it can be important to only introduce elements immediately relevant to understanding the first chapter. Things relevant far later on in the story can be left for the main narrative, otherwise it risks the prologue feeling disconnected. Thirdly, exposition. One of the major criticisms that editors, agents, writers, publishers, readers have of prologues is that they're just exposition dumps, particularly in sci-fi or fantasy, depicting how a sword was made, or how the Dark Lord was originally defeated, or how the Grand Stargate system was set up, or how the Space Potatoes came to rule the Empire. Basically, it's a lore dump about your world's history and politics and laws and magic system which you find fascinating, but no one else does. I mean, it's just a lore dump and pff, who, who would like, who would just read lore dumps and just, just lore books about the world and really boring academic historical language, yeah man. <laughs> oh man, I'd, I'd never do that. Oh baby, talk dirty to me. Appendix B, Tale of the Years. In the year 1000, Sauron, alarmed by the growing power of the Numenorians, chooses Mordor as a land to make a stronghold. He begins building Barad-dûr. Point is, I'm the exception. Most people don't find that stuff inherently interesting. I really recommend watching the two-part series I have on delivering exposition effectively. But I'm not just going to tell you to not have exposition in your prologue, like so many other videos and articles seem to. Instead, we're going to talk about two ways to actually weave exposition in. Mystery and emotionalism. Firstly, or 3A, mystery. 
In Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Chapter 1 is really more of a prologue. It's written from a different perspective to the main character, and it's set a long time in the past. It functionally communicates a bunch of exposition though, like A, that the Dark Lord has been defeated, B, that his name is Voldemort, C, that Lily and James are dead, and D, that there is a wizarding world out there of magical peoples hidden from Muggle sight that have been fighting a war for years. But Rowling communicates all of this with an air of mystery. They're saying he tried to kill Potter's son, Harry, but he couldn't. He couldn't kill that little boy, no one knows why or how, but they're saying that when he couldn't kill Harry Potter, Voldemort's power somehow broke, and that's why he's gone. There's a lot of unknowns in this first chapter, weird things happening that communicate only parts of the full exposition. It creates this mysterious half-finished puzzle for the reader where they are more focused on the questions they have than the exposition they're actually given, as opposed to being told things with absolute certainty. Secondly, or 3B, emotionalism. In George R. R. Martin's A Dance with Dragons, the prologue features a wounded, broken Varamir, a skin changer like Bran. Now, Martin spends most of this chapter actually just developing Varamir as a character, giving us insights into his motivations, what he hates about his life, his failures, how he remembers dying nine times, how that felt, and how exhausted and drained he now feels. The reader is drawn into the experiences of Varamir, this weird character, this guy with a life of very strange experiences. The focus of the story is on his hopes, his fears, and his eventual acceptance of death, but at the same time, Martin communicates a hell of a lot of vital exposition about how the powers of skin changes actually work, how it can drive them mad being stuck in an animal's body for too long, how you can lose your humanity, how you can become too weak to jump into another's mind, and how those strong enough can actually cast you out. These things become important in Bran's storyline later on as he delves into this magic. In the case of both Harry Potter and A Dance with Dragons, the authors only communicate the vital things they want us to know. Rowling doesn't talk about the 1692 Statute of Wizarding Secrecy, she talks about the one vital event that defines Harry's life. Martin uses a whole story to communicate some vital things that explain problems that Bran has to face, and elements of his magic system. Do not use prologues as a means to dump exposition about your world or its lore. Prologue exposition should be limited to a few vital pieces of information. This can be done through creating a mystery by giving only pieces of unexplained but interesting lore, or through emotionalism by contextualizing that lore to the character's emotional experiences. Fourthly, a unique tone, mood, or theme that isn't easy to communicate in the first chapter. For example, James S. A. Corey's book Leviathan Wakes uses its prologue to distinguish his science fiction novel as a mystery, Lovecraftian horror story, something that's not all that common in mainstream science fiction. A torture chamber then. Tubes ran through the ship like veins or airways, part of it pulsed, flesh, an outcropping of the thing shifted towards her. Captain Darren's head. Help me, it said. That last line is the only piece of dialogue at all, creating this creepy, gloomy silence for the reader in the prologue. It's heavy on descriptive language, and it lingers on those things that the reader finds most unsettling, this revolting flesh abomination. This Lovecraftian horror feel wouldn't be as easy to communicate in the first chapter, which features a lighter tone with friendly characters without the biohazard stuff we see here. If your story has an unconventional theme, mood, or tone that will hook the reader, and it cannot be effectively established in the first chapter, then a prologue may be useful. Focus on language and description that highlights that unique feature of your story. But don't confuse using your prologue to establish a unique tone, mood, or theme with using the prologue to have an exciting opening to your book that the first chapter cannot provide. If that's the reason for you having a prologue, then change your first chapter. It should be exciting by itself. Agents and editors are very aware of this trick. And finally, length. In terms of how long a prologue should be, most agents and editors advise for it to be short much shorter than your average chapter. For example, in Avatar The Last Airbender, the prologue is only 1 minute and 17 seconds long, when the average chapter is about 22 minutes long. HA! 
You didn't think I was gonna be able to fit this one in because there's barely a prologue in Avatar The Last Airbender, but I will make it work if I have to. You can have your prologue as a page or even just a couple of paragraphs, it really doesn't have to be that long. As a fun exercise, let's consider the prologue from Eragon, which I realise many of you might love. I did too as a kid, it was my favourite book, I read it like 13 times, but let's think about it critically. It depicts Arya being cornered by the Shade, Durza, and then her sending the egg west, where Aragorn finds it. Does this book have two distinct hooks? Well, not really. The question of the prologue is, what is this magical sapphire stone? Which, given the cover, isn't even that much of a mystery. And the question we ask in Aragorn's first chapter is, what is this magical sapphire stone? Is the prologue necessary? Well, it tells us that Durza and Arya are out there, but not much more. If anything, it somewhat demystifies the dreams that Aragorn has later on in the book. So when Aragorn finds out who it is, all shocked, the reader is just like, Oh, who could have guessed? To be fair, it's not an exposition dump, but it doesn't really communicate much more than who Durza is really, and Durza isn't even that interesting. Well then, does it perhaps communicate a unique tone, mood, or theme? This is partly why the prologue in Aragorn is criticised. It may communicate the traditional Tolkien-esque feel to the story, but this doesn't communicate anything that the reader isn't expecting. We sort of have an underlying assumption that fantasies will be like that unless we're told otherwise. All of this is a lot of information to take down, I know, so I would like to thank today's sponsor, Squarespace, who helped me build my own website where you can find this script, as well as a number of others, as research notes for you when you go to write your own prologue. If you are interested in building your own website, then Squarespace has turned out pretty damn great for me. It's easy to use for any kind of artist, writer, photographer, or whatever else you might be and I found it super easy to use easy to get a handle on for someone who isn't that great with website building by itself and it has 24 7 365 day support for those who want it if you want to start building your own website try my Squarespace link that's kind of important to help you along with that you will get 10% off your first purchase with them and if you just go to squarespace.com slash hello future me or click the link in the description you can start building your own that's squarespace.com slash hello future me to get started today link down in the description so what have we discussed today firstly have hooks that target two different points of tension in the narrative in the prologue and first chapter if used that hook should be something unable to be communicated through the experiences of the main characters secondly a prologue must be necessary Backstory prologues are generally better if they only provide backstory insofar as it helps the reader understand the very first chapter, or at least the beginning of the story. Thirdly, avoid prologues that are exposition dumps. Weave exposition in through emotionalism and mystery. Fourthly, prologues can be used to communicate a unique tone, mood, or theme that can't be effectively demonstrated in the first chapter. Ultimately, don't do a prologue unless it's necessary and you can do it well. But at the same time, write the story that you want to tell. Maybe it might not be the best storytelling technique. Maybe it might make it a little bit of a drag at the beginning. But if that is the story that you want to write, then your only responsibility as a writer is to do that. You're not obligated to stick up to these standards that people hold up online. I'm just here to try and give some thoughts for you to consider. But that is all from me. My question, what happens in your prologue, why does it work, if you used one, and if you haven't, what would your prologue be like? Let me know down in the comments below. In the meantime, come follow me over on Twitter, I'm highlighting that one especially because that is the one that I use the most, pretty much, I, I very rarely post to Facebook and stuff. Come follow me there, you can ask me questions, I'm usually pretty responsive, or I try to be. If you want to support the channel with this sort of educational content, I've got my Patreon link down below, you've heard all this before. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this little video on prologues. I've always had weird feelings about them because I really like them, but a lot of people really hate them. Anyways, have a good uh, evening, day, morning, whatever time it is for you. Stay nerdy, and I will see you in the future.